Hi everyone, I'm Steve Love, this is Francis Bontempo, and we were due to talk to you live about automated and unit testing and some of the excuses that people use for not doing it. But owing to an unreliable internet connection, we pre-recorded it. So the uh, guys are going to stream this for us. Um, so it's just over an hour. So should have time for about 15, 20 minutes of Q&A at the end. But we will be watching the chat and the Q&A window. And we'll be able to interact with you there if you've got questions or comments. And in the meantime, I think, sit back and enjoy the show. Hammer time. Let's talk about testing. I'm Fran. This is Steve. Hi. Loads of times people say, you can't test this. And we're going to look at some excuses, reasons and ways to get stuff under test. And we're going to find a lot of the time it's about breaking it down. So let's let's think about the idea of you can't test this. Who's you? You can't run the whole env on your machine. If you've got a big enterprise system, you might be that you can't do databases, you can't put the cloud on your machine and so on. Maybe you're banned from re seeing real data, not allowed to see prod data if you're just a dev. Maybe you're a BA. So if you're a business analyst, it might be you can't run the code until all the devs have actually got on with things and deployed it to UAT. Maybe the team used to write tests, but it held up a release so they banned you from having tests locally. Or maybe you got your head down as a dev and you think, well, the testers will test it for you later. These are all poor excuses. We'll dig into these later on. You can't test this. Code uses other parts of the system that don't exist yet. Oh, well, a common thing I've had problems with, and Steve's seen the same thing too, and seen solutions to it is if you've got some DBAs writing all the database stuff and it's not on the database yet, how on earth do you deal with that? Pro tip, if you can get a copy of the database locally, then bosh. Or you could stub that bit out, right? There are solutions. Or I'm writing a long, complicated bit of code and it's not finished yet, so I can't tell whether it works or not until we've until I've written the whole thing. That's a poor excuse as well. I mean, if you're cooking, you don't go, well, I'm, I won't know what it tastes like until I finish cooking it. You test taste it as you go to work out if you need a bit more salt or if you put too much Scotch bonnet chilli in. It's a different story. I, uh, my background is in mathematics, and the way you do that is you tend to, if you're trying to prove something really difficult, you work out what which bits and building blocks you need first. You write little lemmas that are smaller things you can prove, and you're sure they're certain that you prove they work, and then you can piece them together before, to make the big thing. So small baby steps, break it down. And there might be corollaries that follow from that things that you can work out must be true after you've done the thing. Another excuse for not being able to test things is it's got random numbers in, so it does something different every time. Now, we'll look at that in detail. That's a poor excuse. Embedded software. How am I supposed to test this? I can't test it because the hardware it's going to run on doesn't exist yet. Emulators, anyone? Let's wait around this. I put all the code in main so all the controllers are behind the button clicks. Yeah, well, who put that there? Like, there's ways of structuring your code so you don't have all the functionality in one main function. Don't do that. You can structure your code so that it's testable. Right, so I, I said some of these are excuses. I could rant about random for ages. You redefine random when you call your random number of providers from your libraries, whichever language you're using, they give you a number back. So you can stub that out and have something that always returns a zero or a one. That's a surprisingly useful way to find things out. You can seed your random numbers so you know what numbers you expect every time, but I think as a Start of 10, just stub out the function, 
have something that returns zero instead. You could do it with mocking or patching, depending on what languages you're using, or you just pass in the random number provider, or hang it, just pass in a number and call the actual random thing in your real code outside. Corollary of this, if you see, if you've got a block of code that calls out to something like a singleton, like date time or random or similar, you've lost control over things. And they are, in a sense, a singleton that you're reaching out to in the middle of a code block. So never trust a singleton. So, like I said, if you spot something like calling out to round or even calling out to time in the middle of a function, you're in trouble. So don't trust singletons. You can't test this. You don't know what it's supposed to do yet. Well, that's OK. And actually, that's why it's quite cool not waiting till things get to U18 to be able to talk to some of the BAs or the end customers and users first as soon as possible. It writes everything to the screen. Well, who did that? You can write to other streams instead and see what they do. You can pipe what's going to the screen to a log file and just see what, just compare the log file with a diff. That's a way of doing things. As I understand it, Steve did a bit of stuff about formal proofs in his degree. Do you want to tell Once us upon a time. about that? I don't think I can talk about that in a talk. Well, yeah, OK, you can't talk. A formal <laughs> proofs talk would be a huge talk. Yeah. Do you need to be certain of everything? You've no, neither of us have used formal proofs in an industrial no. setting. You can, and that can try and help you be certain of everything, but it's better to be certain of some stuff. We can be convinced that some parts of it are working, but formal proofs would have to be another talk another time. Some things are hard to replicate in test. If you've got multi-user environments or multi-threading, you frequently end up with race conditions that get flushed out in prod that don't happen locally. And there are slightly nudged towards formal ways of evoking that and making sure you get every possible combination of which order things happen in, which might be worth looking at. But if you need to make sure the basic building blocks are all right as well. And again, we, there's not going to be space or time to look at these larger topics in this talk but we'll look at some simpler things that keep things right. There's other things that are hard to replicate in tests, like environmental problems, such as servers going down, or trees falling on the line. But pro tip, you can always pull out your Ethernet cable. You can ape some of these things and see what happens. Let's just wind back, think about what we're doing when we're testing things. The word test comes from the idea of assaying metals and things, and comes from the word of a, a little old clay pot that you just melt something down in and see what you've got, see what it's made of, see what its constituents parts are, oh, break it down. We talked about screens just now and I mean I said you can log things out as well or send put things in a stream. Again if you've got a printf statement or something like that where you're reaching out to stand it out in the middle of the screen We've got a singleton, and we've already learned never trust a singleton. So you can swap that out. All right, you can't test this. Where, what is this? Nattered about database procedures and schema updates. If you've just got a script, there's no point testing a Bash script, right? Or a Python script, or, well, maybe some of your C++ is just a utility script. You probably want to be sure it actually works, so it's code, it's all code. How do you test interactions with a third party library, particularly if they haven't actually written the library yet? Pro tip? Pro tip, dependency injection. And so with things that, that you can use, as Kevin Henney talks about quite often, the idea of uncertainty to drive your design. Um, and dependency injection doesn't need a framework. So really, at it's, its most basic level, dependency injection is passing things as parameters to constructors or to methods, functions, rather than calling out to them, as we saw in code earlier on, about even calling to uh, std c out, and, and there was a call to a random function, so pass things in rather than reaching out for them. 
And using the uncertainty to drive the design focuses your mind on how you want to use something. So your third party library that doesn't exist yet. If you're writing the code that will be the consumer of it, then to an extent, you get to decide what those APIs look like. And the same applies with the bigger things like microservices um, or web services is trying to decide what the usage is going to be to drive the design often results in a cleaner design anyway, rather than being restricted to what a library already looks like. Yeah, I guess you've given yourself some power and some control by breaking it down and deciding what endpoint you want and if the eventual third-party library software has got loads of extra gump that you didn't need, you can do like adapt patterns and things to just make your life easier. Of course, if you end up with microservices and 30 different APIs to talk to each other with different versions you might, and you've changed the interface, you might need to check that things work together nicely. But the testing frameworks like PACT to help you do that. So it is possible. Don't give up hope. If you've got a failover script and you've just got one machine, how on earth do you test that? Well, there's ways and means you can have two processes and pull one down. You just need to loose your imagination <laughs> on this. Or work with a friend and make it fail over to their machine or something. Just try it, see what it does. Don't like base it on trying to reason it through and go, right, I'm sure it works because I thought this through. You need to prove it a bit, see what happens. You can't test this changes over time. We've already mentioned this true story. Once upon a time, somebody said this test is going to take a day to run. Why? Because it's looking at the difference in value between something yesterday and today. And that's 24 hours apart. Yeah, but if you sent in what the date time was, along with the numbers, then it, it could have run in less than 24 hours. Never trust a single <coughs> term, like I said. So, as I was saying, lie about, we lied about random numbers earlier. Lie about date time now. Lie loads. Change the date time. Change now. And then you can make it be 24 hours in the future. Just like that. Nice and quick. Oh, questions about testing. Lots of questions. Let's look at some questions. Why do we test? I guess that's the fundamental question. So I'll come up with four, possibly five Ds. So first of all, we're trying to dispel doubt. You, When I was younger, I tended to write code and reason it through in my head and go, yeah, I'm convinced it works. But I can't hold all that state in my head anymore. And I frequently missed things. So if I can come out with some tests that someone else can run as well, then I can talk to my customers. I can talk to my colleagues. I can talk to myself which I frequently do, but just see what I've actually done. It gives me some confidence. You can ask what you mean by confidence. There's confidence that the code's doing what you think it's doing, confidence that the code's doing what the customers wanted it to do. And then confidence that your colleagues haven't jobbed you over. I shall explain the seagull merges shortly. Moving on from dispelling doubt, we've said about talking to your customers. So it gives you a discussion point. If you're talking with business people, you can get quite abstract. You can do whiteboarding sessions. But if you've got some actual code that they can play with and try out, then they can tell you, oh, I don't like that colour. And then you can flush out small things earlier on. And it's much easier if you've got a concrete example to reason about, play with, see what happens. And you can use the tests as a discussion point with people, write some new ones, flush out the edge cases, decide what it's supposed to do there. And that moves on to documentation. I hate documentation. There's either too much or not enough, and it gets out of sync with code, and there are ways around that, and that's another talk. But a bottom line for me is I tend to look straight for the tests, and it shows me what the happy path is, what it's supposed to do under what circumstances. And if I needle with the code, I know if I've broken it. So tests should be up-to-date documentation. And it shows me how to use the code as well, how to call the functions, what things I need to set up. So what's not to like? This raises a question about structuring your tests too, because just having a suite of unit tests can be a bit 
impenetrable if you're just trying to find out what the happy paths are or if you're find, trying, you know, you're using those tests to find out what the usage examples are. And so it can be a really another pro tip um, to deliberately structure your tests to pull those things out. So that they're the first things that people see um, and deliberately name the tests to be those examples of, you know, test how to open a connection to the microservice or test how to obtain customer information from the database. And that's a, a really obvious way that people can immediately look at the tests and see that these are documentary tests rather than regression packs or whatever else it may be, the, the, the unhappy parts, as it were. Well, it shows you how to do the thing yeah. nice and quickly, and you can copy paste that bit of code and bosh, not the copy pasted code is good. And another thing about the test that I think is often overlooked is about discovery. I mean, it shows you what it does, but if you want to know what happens under some obscure edge cases, like an interest rate going negative, you've immediately got some way you can inject some different numbers in to see what happens. And I frequently see people talking about load and performance testing and wanting a set of realistic prod-like data and then spending ages getting the data and then they can't have the data because it's got personally identifiable information in or secrets and then there's a big fight and then there's loads of meetings and but tell you something if you've got some tests and you run them on ci every time and you keep some artifacts of what's happened you can do little graphs and you can spot things that are slowing down or if somebody wants to know how quick will this be just breaking it down starting with unit tests around stuff if something normally runs in nanoseconds and suddenly starts taking a second each time if that's run on a tight loop in something like a monte carlo simulation you know before you even do the load or performance testing that you've made it thousands and thousands of times slower so you catch that before you even get to that point the tests show you the timings and characteristics of the thing that you've built you can find out so much from this doesn't need to be like proper formal testing or anything even just a bit is enough to learn stuff I said I was going to tell you about seagull merges. I think Steve came out with this phrase, possibly in conjunction with Chris Oldwood. No, it was oh. later than that. Oh, OK. That's possibly another story. I've been jobbed over twice by seagull merges. Fran writes a test and some code, pushes it to the repo, runs on CI, everything's good. A few days or hours later, someone comes to Fran's desk and goes, why have you got added this test to the repo that fails? I'm like, oh, I don't think I did. And look at what's happened. And both, true story, on both occasions, they hadn't written any tests, they hadn't gone near the tests for a bit of code. They were confronted with a conflict. They said, mine, and deleted Fran's new functionality, and the test caught them out and they tried blaming me, but by looking at the version control, I could see what had happened. And the solution to that was a hooray for Fran writing tests because it caught them trying to catch me out. And B, then we talked about how to get some tests around their code and how to put my feature back, which they deleted by doing a seagull merge. Yeah, think when you're merging code and have a look at what you've done. And Write some tests yourself, but you might notice your colleagues have written some too. True story. Okay, we've talked about why we're testing. What should we test? Well, sometimes we do test a developer's patience, to be honest. Sometimes there are no tests, and that's frustrating. Manual testing is slow. Sometimes there are too many tests. We'll come back to that. There's a slew of words on this slide. Basically, you can try and test anything if you put your mind to it. But it's coolest if you can come out with some kind of automated test that you can check into version control and have running by the machines rather than you having to click the buttons. Just because something's just a script doesn't mean we can't test it. And you can do tests in the database. You can do tests in databases directly. That's another talk that's been given before. Sometimes you're just testing, you haven't broken anything. Sometimes you can start looking at the coverage of your code, see if you've got some code in there that's never been called, 
delete it in that case. That offers the coverage. Another pro tip. You hope it does. Yeah, if it doesn't, then that's a different <coughs> story. But like I said, you can actually look at performance of things as well. You can discover so much. So just test anything you feel like. Give it a go. Be great. <coughs> How do we test things? I mean, we've looked at why we test, we've looked at what we test, but we haven't really talked about how we test. There are loads of different words around this. People talk about end-to-end -end testing, integration testing, unit testing. I met some people who are really purist about this and demanded if I've got a function that uses two different objects that I mock one of them out, so I'm only testing one of them. Honestly, I'm not a purist. I don't care. If I've got something I'm calling unit test, if it's using two different objects, I don't care if it's quick, if it's slow, that's testing my patience. I remember one of the things that you said to me about unit test years ago was about on a machine that's not connected to a network that, or potentially to a screen. Yeah. And being able to test independently is, that's a closer definition of unit testing than only testing one object at a time. Yeah, not all code has got objects in any way. Sometimes you're allowed to do free functions in some languages. So I'm not a purist. If some of your colleagues are, okay, fine, negotiate with them, sneak stuff in when they're not looking, whatever. There's pen testing stuff as well. That's, that's a whole other talk too. We should try and think about some security in your code as well. Like I said, just make sure it's automatically Maybe use a testing framework, but there's no shame in hand rolling stuff if it makes things work, if you're trying out something a bit language. Should you test it in the language you've written it in? It depends. It doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong in writing some Python scripts to test some database stuff. It's quite cool if you can write some database stuff to test the database stuff. It doesn't matter as long as it's giving you confidence. Keep your eye on why you're doing this how you do it don't go all cargo cult and go well i've done the things i've only got unit tests and the rest just keep that big overall picture of why i'm doing this i want to make sure i'm confident it works it does what's needed and it's as it's quick enough that's what matters um there's yeah so many opinions on how we test things and the idea of that inside out versus outside in testing we gradually build up your code, some kind of test-driven development style, whether you do it with little bits around the minutiae of building blocks you're building up, or whether you mock stuff out and then gradually add real bricks in. Whatever works for you and you're comfortable with and works with your colleagues, I don't care as long as it's quick and gives me that confidence, coverage and sense of what it does and how quick it is. Yeah, some see manual testing is all right and or you can automate the idea of a chaos monkey. I don't know if you've come across this before or not. Most people might have done. But something that just randomly goes around, drops network connections and things. I think Netflix possibly invented mm, it, one of the big tech companies, and they automated that. But you can do that manually. You can pull your network cable out. See, see if you're not connected to the internet, do your unit tests run. If not, then maybe you carve stuff up differently. The idea of confidence is really underrated, I think, in having a suite of tests that give you confidence, that give your customers confidence, because that can drive the focus of your testing rather than just hammering out unit tests to test all the getters, test all the setters, test all the methods, and what are you really testing that they exist, rather than focusing on the behavior. Um, but thinking about what would make you confident in releasing your code. or So part of confidence is that when it comes to release day, that you're confident that it's not going to go wrong and that having enough testing at the unit test level up front obviously feeds into that confidence. Not just your confidence, but your stakeholders' confidence, your manager's confidence, and the rest of the team. I would imagine many of us have come across the testing pyramid before. We, we talked about unit tests and that the idea of the testing pyramid is it's cool to have <coughs> as much coverage with the unit tests as possible. And as you go up to more and more layers of the whole 
gigantic beast you've created, you want fewer tests. Why? Well, the isolation of the unit tests means that they will run much, much faster. So if someone claims they've got unit test and their unit test suite takes an hour to run, it's too slow. And as you get more and more integrations, you've got more moving parts happening together. That's allowing you to test some other things, but they'll be slower, so you might have fewer of those. I've, I've come across the idea a few times of that so-called um, testing ice cream cone, where you've got very few unit tests, loads of integration tests, hundreds of automated end-to-end -end tests, and then just a big splat on the top of you manually testing stuff as well, like running it into a UAT environment, clicking all the buttons yourself to check it all works and things. Oh. And in the, in the last few years, I've seen a lot of people who got a few unit tests and hundreds of end-to-end -end tests. And that's, again, it's because the end-to-end -end tests, what, what do you think their confidence level is? And if they go wrong, they tend to say, went wrong after 15 minutes. You're like, I suspect it might have been something smaller and quicker I could have done earlier. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a pyramid or your ice cream cone, flip it upside down to your ice cream cone ID, you've got something inherently unstable, and you'll often see the end-to-end -end tests, something flaky happen, and someone go, oh, if you run it again, it might pass. And if I do that, I'm like, but that means, yeah, okay, it's passed now, but it failed just now, and I don't know why. And maybe somebody yeah. changed something in the database in between the two runs. But that means I have proved the code might not work properly. And that's not why I'm doing testing. It's not what I'm here for. I don't like unstable. No. Talked about why and so on. When do we test? As often as possible. <laughs> Pro tip. Do you only test when things are finished? Um, that's something we used to do years ago. In we hammer out the code, and then you give yourself two days at the end of a six month. I was going to say sprint, but yeah, okay. Yeah. And then suddenly it all goes wrong, and then you're trying to do it over the weekend and things. Like yeah, I said about cooking, if you're doing something that takes a while, maybe taste it as you go. And testing is always the thing that gets cut when schedules are tight. We should <coughs> stop coding when schedules are tight and do less. That's probably worth more. Test before each commit. Oh, that's so good. I love that. Be able to just test something locally and things. But yeah, see what your version control thing is doing. Make sure that you can run those scripts. Yeah, check yeah. what CI is doing and check you can run those scripts locally. Just, yeah, quicker, quicker, quicker. As you go. Every line you change, see what happens. By an automated test, not stepping through the debugger. I catch myself doing that. I know I've lost the plot. I mean, it's good to check stuff out in UAT as well. Go and sit with the testers afterwards and see their perspective on what you've met. OK, COVID socially distant over the internet testing, but it's OK to test it in UAT as well, whenever, as often as possible. Test early, test often. Stop at that point. But there's more questions. Where do we test this? Do I just test it on my machine? Well, that'd be good, but it's, it is quite useful to have some continuous integration running. I keep saying to myself on my personal projects, I'm going to set up CI because I've occasionally gone, oh, I'm running out of time, I'm just going to commit it now and it doesn't work. Oh. I think that continuous integration is it, is it addresses that it worked on my machine syndrome mm. when it breaks for somebody else. So as long as your tests pass on your CI server, then you don't have to worry about it works or it only works on my machine. Yeah. It might be things that you're developing on one operating system, but some people might be using it on a different one. So there's ways of testing things. And if you are doing UI work, bless you, it's not. I'm rubbish at UI stuff and shouldn't be allowed. But then you can try things out with different browsers and stuff. So yeah, there's just so much more possibility if you've got some <coughs> CI set up. Where do we test? Well, like I said, we can test in UAT, but not only there. Don't test stuff in prod. Log stuff in prod. Try out some AB releases and things in prod. But that's not testing, is it? That's exploring. That's, that's diagnosis by yeah, the time it's got yeah. there. 
uh, confidence before diagnosis afterwards. Do you only use official testing frameworks? Maybe. But just release your imagination and try stuff out. And like I said, just put simple things like pull out a network cable or kill minus nine one of your processes and things. But you can automate, that's fine. Where do you test? Some testing in your head is a good idea. Step away from the keyboard sometimes, especially if you've caught yourself debugging for ages. Just go for a walk and have a word with yourself. Talk to a rubber duck, tell it all about it. Sometimes just stopping and having a bit of a think, stepping back, you notice things you haven't tried or you've missed. I know, right, here's the thing. Are you sure you've released what you've actually tested? You might have tested something locally and then somebody changes the database and then there's an off update. And so, but that's back to doing things little and often and having CI. Worked in a couple of places where the official release was done by one of the developers collecting all of the bits on their own workstation and building it and then copying the binaries into production. And well, the short version of that story is don't do that because it does go wrong. Really? Whose responsibility is it? Well, yeah, so who does the testing? Well, everyone's, frankly. Sometimes people leave it just to QA and testers, but come on, devs, test your code. Get your teammates to test your code. Talk with your customers and users, see how they use it as well. That's really fascinating, watching something you've created actually being used. And then sometimes you go, ah, that's what the big fuss has been about. Having someone else test your stuff has its benefits, but can you be sure they will actually do it? Back to the confidence thing. And what about when it will get done? I've seen things where I've focused on some of the unit test and minutia stuff, but not run main through and it's crashed straight away, giving it to the testers. And they've gone, I can't test this, it doesn't even run. So just, just try the thing. Try the thing. Maybe you can put some smoke tests in your CI or something, but try running it yourself. Excuses for not doing testing. We have covered a few of the bits that are crop up here. We talked about singletons and random numbers mm -hmm. and date time and things, but there's more. I did th test this, but it took hours. Did I mention the date time thing? I don't know, that's the thing. Or like that ice cream cone thing. Maybe you've got too many tests and around some places that are really slow that you don't need. It's okay to delete code. It's okay to delete tests. I did test this, but I don't know what it's supposed to do under these specific circumstances. Great, then you've got a test. It's all right to have a failing test and go talk to a teammate or a customer or someone. That's that's useful. The test failed. Yeah. You need to look at why <coughs> they failed then. And like I said about flaky tests that sometimes fail, but just own it. Find out what's going wrong. Break it down. Have smaller steps that are robust, consistent, and give you the confidence. I have no idea what went wrong. Well, that's about being canny with messages that come out and possibly doing smaller things rather than bigger things. I can't debug the tests. Yeah, you shouldn't need to debug your tests. The test should tell you what happened with what inputs so that you can figure out what went wrong. So those things kind of relate back to what you were talking about earlier, um, where you've got <clears throat> a big end-to-end -end testing that just tells you it went wrong. And one of the big things about that unit tests give you is very specific point of failure in a very small, constrained part of the code, and hopefully with a good, uh, an error message that tells you exactly what went wrong, which is much more difficult to achieve. And then, mm -hmm. okay, so it's okay to debug unit tests sometimes, but you, you know, that's it, a smell. It is a bit of a smell to me. But, but yeah, it's, if you've it's, got, everything's okay. If you've got, time. if all you've got is the big end-to-end -end testing, then debugging is the only tool in your toolbox. That's a wrong kind of hammer. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you test your code to pieces, and the people using the software hate it for a variety of reasons. 
I see quite a lot of time software development is actually about people to talk to and find out what the pain points are and things. If you're a library writer, that's frequently a thing. So have a way of people doing bug reports or giving you some tests that fail that do their heading. Talk to people. It's a thing. And if you release things earlier, you might find out that it's a wrong colour earlier on. Story about spent three months in a company years ago deploying some so writing some software for some fishermen. And apparently they're slightly superstitious sometimes and they don't like green. We would have found that out a lot earlier on if we'd showed them some incremental steps rather than at the end of three months doing a software demo on, on the first screen. They went, no, and left the building and we had to rewrite stuff. I mean, yeah. I did test this. Now, all right, let's. I we mentioned in the spiel for this talk, I was going to stray into stuff about data science and machine learning code. We've not mentioned that yet, but here we go. Well, we mentioned random numbers, and that's a big part of some data science stuff. But now, right, sometimes if a data scientist says they tested their code, you need to ask them what they actually did. Because in data science land and statistics land, you often test a model by which you mean you see how accurate it is. That I would try to encourage a data scientist to call evaluating a model. Because they haven't tested the code at that point. They've tested or seen how good the model is, which you need to do, you absolutely need to do, and it's fundamental part of statistics and data science. But make sure you're using the same words when you talk to people. If someone starts talking about true positives, false negatives, accuracy, holdout methods and things, they're using different words to you. So just uh, keep that in mind. Another thing that goes wrong when you're testing is, you end up replicating the code in the test. Um, how do you test FizzBuzz without implementing FizzBuzz? Well, I talked to Kevin Henney. He boiled it down to, I think there were eight properties that gave you full coverage of everything that was supposed to happen, which, like every multiple of three, is a Fizz. But you can do that without replicating the code. If you catch yourself replicating the code to test the code, that should be a bit of a smell because, you know, you're not really testing it properly. You need to step back and start thinking about what sort of properties you need to hold. So instead of forming it in terms of code and the procedure that's happening, step back and go, what's it supposed to be doing? OK, when would it be zero? Back to the data science stuff. It's. You can reason in your head about when what happens if you send in zeros. Frequently, you'll get zeros back out. And so you can build up a suite. Frequently, you'd expect to get zeros back out. And and not you often get error <laughs> messages and NAND with crashes, or you get, you get nuns out of a lot of data science code. Not like convent type nuns, different kind of techie nuns. It <coughs> doesn't matter. <coughs> Um, indeed. Yes. Yeah. If you if you can start thinking about what you actually need it to do, and think about the test name and what you're actually trying to test, that's giving you confidence rather than how it's implemented. So properties and behaviour are similar, right? Yeah. The properties that are whole that you expect to hold, and the behaviour that a thing has. Yeah. They are, you know, they're they're not necessarily exactly the same thing, but they're close. They are pretty closely related, and it is a bank testing the things that are going to give you confidence that it works rather than just hammering on each of the nails. Yeah, and that <coughs> pulls you back to what you're trying to do on the specific implementation you've come out with so that you're hitting the right things with the hammer. Okay, again, data scientists, what do we do if we haven't got any real data yet? <sighs> Or if you're not allowed to use real data. Yeah, well, we talked, we talked about PPI about yeah. earlier on and things like that. Right, OK, why do people insist on using real data? I, I don't get it. I, they tell me why, but I, all I'm hearing is that, well, if it's not like prod, it might come out of something we haven't thought of. Well, like, think normal uses is more important than the edge cases. That sentence means 
that you're willing to not bother testing some stuff. I mean, yeah, you can go to town and go, what if there's a cosmic ray that flips a bit in a thing of stuff? Mm. Well, that, I mean, that's okay. If something weird and random happens, you don't necessarily want to spend hours coming up with the behaviour, but you want to check it's got a message in the log file saying, what the heck just happened, so that you could diagnose it. You can't make software foolproof because Frank can break anything if she puts her mind to it. But you might. And you especially can't make it foolproof if you don't test the edge cases. Yeah, just don't give up on this. Yeah, I talked about volume and performance testing earlier. You can find out a surprising amount about that by looking, at inspecting the individual building blocks that you're having going on. You can come out with, if you know the kind of data you're talking about, you can come out with artificial data sets that will push boundaries, edge cases, have more normal data than usual. But you might not need to run something through a thousand times on the normal cases unless you're doing the load testing. Mm. But you can still reason about that. And it might be, instead of doing something on a Monte Carlo simulation with 100,000 mm. steps, you can find enough out about it with just two or three or just once through the loop and then time to feedback being quicker confidence flush out problems first there's um if your load testing is testing your performance and it's all running within your performance boundaries is that good enough if the numbers it produces are wrong or if the numbers are right and it's within the boundaries right. of what's happened so far, do you know about the profile of the beast you've created in terms of what happened if there is a spike at some point? Mm. Or if things drop off and you're running it in the cloud, are you paying even if you're not doing anything? There's lots of things you can find out with testing and numbers. The numbers are wrong talking of numbers. Yeah, so... I mean, this is a cry of all users and analysts everywhere. The numbers are always wrong. I mean, it's a thing. So instead of trying loads of different random numbers and trying realistic data, break it down, step back. Like I said, if you've got a complicated looking formula, frequently if you put zero in, most and loads of the terms end up at zero. If you're dividing by something, you might want to send one in instead. True story, somebody built a piecewise curve in a library I was using. So you do that by having a bit of a curve and another bit, and you make sure you join them up. And then you can cover all kinds of weird and wacky shapes. But some strange stuff was happening and the numbers were wrong. So instead of sending in realistic data, I just sent in loads of zeros. And it had this weird blip in the middle because we've got a less than rather than a less than or equal to. But just sending in the zeros made it really apparent exactly where the problem was. And that was a bit of an arm wrestle of, no, I don't care what you think about real data. I'm sending in zeros. Oh, look, that's what the problem is. And real data led to tales of rounding errors and floating point inaccuracies and lies. <coughs> I've told you my true story. <laughs> and here's another true story. Recently overheard, I'm not an engineer, but I don't understand how you can test something you haven't built yet. Mm-hmm. Had a little chat with Steve about this, and then I nearly ended up watching introduction to bricklaying on the internet. But that's my problem. Tell us about bricks, Steve. Well, yeah, so it's a simple thing, but... If you watch somebody laying bricks and they've got a trowel and a thing of cement cement, and they pick up a brick and they go tink, tink with the handle of the trowel on each brick before they put it in. Now, I've never spoken to a bricklayer about this, but it occurs to me that that's a very simple form of testing every single brick because if you tink, tink with the handle and the brick crumbles, they're not going to use the brick. And that's literally testing the component parts before the structure that's being built is in place. And it's a different level of test. The testing that you would do when the thing Mm. is in place is going to be different. But testing each of the component parts is, that's a very similar thing. It's a good analogy for unit testing. Yeah. If you've got a watch that's 
not working. If you watch people who know what they're doing with clocks and watches, uh, eyepiece in, tinkering with the little bits, but some, yeah, you do need to examine the constituent parts sometimes to find out what's happening in the overall problem. Yeah, break it down, build it back up again. Okay, maybe we don't have an environment to test in yet. We've we've mentioned that. Another thing we didn't mention earlier on was about licenses for message queues yeah. and things like that. <coughs> okay, putting a stunt double brick or something or a bit of cardboard for this bit of wall. Just, <laughs> just stub it out, fake it out. You can't do it there. Use your imagination. Do something else instead. You need a way of remembering to take the bit of cardboard out. And the same, in, uh, same for production code as well. You don't want to be releasing your mocks into production. Yeah. So you need there, there needs to be a process in place to ensure that it doesn't happen. Yeah, well, I guess if you've got a test framework set up or a main set up, you switch things out with some config. But, yeah, yeah, be careful. That famously the, um, the Goose book where... Well, they, we talked about the inside out versus outside, outside in, in earlier. Yeah. Um, but they, they pulled out fairly early on in the book about the fact that they've got all of these tests in place, but this, they've never actually tested that the system would start. Yeah. Um, and that became apparent. At the, I mean, it's a while since I read the book, but possibly at their first demo. Um, and yeah, they, they mentioned that in the first chapter of having got loads of unit tests in place, but may not working. That's why they moved to having main working, gradually swapping out the mocks to some real stuff. Yeah, good book. Growing object-oriented software guided by tests. That's the one. Oh, I was testing it. It was all going wrong. Help, I'm debugging a test. Well, I, we talked about that earlier, didn't we? The one thing I would, yes, sometimes you need to. It's fine, but... Frequently, you don't have to. And I, one of my bugbears is getting the messages in the unit tests useful and clear. Uh, and we'll come back to that. Another, another thing of, OK, it's all taking too long. Now, OK, aside from the 24 hours later, as I was using the date time now in the middle of the function, her tales from a lot of places where we've got something like the ice cream cone thing, but it might not be manual stuff at the top. Or maybe they've got unit tests around everything. I think it was a guy from Elasticsearch who mm. was talking to us um, uh, at New York. He said their whole test suite took 72 hours to run. So you'd do a pull request to get your code in, and <clears throat> like three days later, it would be allowed through, and it was flushing out problems. But that made the time to feedback really slow and quite painful to run. They tended to just run a smaller set locally and then throw it onto the build box to see what would happen. I would find that really awkward to work with. Maybe you could just do the slow tests at the weekend or something. All right, that means something's broken over the last week. That's the team decision how you run this. If you've got a set of tests that are taking hours to run, it is worth doing a keep what sparks joy and say thank you to the old ones that aren't in use anymore. Sometimes you will find oh, you kind of want something like coverage, but more than coverage, I guess profiling tools. Again, hang on, I'm hitting this happy path 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. Could possibly just <clears throat> do slightly less. Yeah, so like I said, separate fast and slow tests. Measure the coverage of the code if you've got something that's not required, fine. If you're missing some of the bits but you keep hitting the happy path bit, you need to have a think about that. Code coverage tools measure the coverage of the code. That's not telling you the coverage of the requirements, which might, which again means you need to talk to people sometimes. Show your BAs the tests. Make sure everyone on the team can see CI, see what the tests are, see if something fails. Look at what you're actually doing and go, oh, no, actually, I don't want it to do that. Use it as a way to talk to each other. So many times only the devs can see CI. Wrong. How do I do this stuff? So I talked about good fail messages to avoid debugging tests. Yeah. 
like another thing that happens is a lot of the testing frameworks have the idea of an actual value and an expected value and you end up with some very strange messages if you put those in backwards i'll show you an example in a moment so some um guidelines will say oh you shouldn't have null argument exceptions and get opinionated about things but if you get a null argument exception back from something that's told you precisely what things were so rebel a little bit just make sure it's telling you what's going on so a it gives you confidence and b if something goes wrong you know what happened oh i'm like it's debugging it's boring assert true i don't like assert true Let's have some fizz bars. Let's see, we've written some fizz bars and we've got an assert that says assert true fizz bars of three equals fizz, because that's what you'd expect for three, one, two, fizz. If I've got everything completely wrong, that assert's going to say assertion error, error, false is not true. And much as that might be true, I don't know what's gone wrong. Pro tip. Say so assert equal, guess what happens? Oops, I've clearly forgotten to put the fizz in the thing, and he's now saying I'm getting three back instead of fizz. No, I have to, don't need to step in the debugger. You use the frame to avoid assert true. That's just a heuristic. Sometimes it's exactly the right thing to do. That's why TDD is good, right? It's failing test first, just to see what the message is. See if it's useful. I, mean, I mentioned about um, expected values versus actual values, and this does flip which way around the parameters go between unit testing frameworks. Yeah. So just see what the message says. <coughs> now, I mean, at this point, I haven't actually called fizzbars on five. Apologies, but the point is to show what the error message is, and it fits on the slide better that way. If I say assert the buzz is equal to, well, it should have been fizz buzz of five, but let's get a failing test. The error says expected five, but was buzz. I put it to the honourable gentleman that a better message might have been you expected buzz, but was five, because the parameters are the other way round in that one. So just re run the test see what the message says and loads of people aren't bothered by that but it does my head in so i get confused read the docs find out how to express messages really clearly so a lot of times i see people always doing a custom message on the fails and most testing frameworks of people have put a lot of work into just it trying to show you exactly what's happened you hide some information when you do that all the time so avoid custom messages Unless you need to, that's fine. Play with the tools you're driving. Maybe read the manual, or if you can't be bothered, just write a failing test first and play the message so it's clear. Don't debug tests unless you have to. Yeah, I, I mean, that's so basic stuff. Get a hang of your testing framework, see what messages you get out of it. And you can start playing around with mock stubs and stunt doubles. Sometimes the mocks get out of hand, <clears> and you can see that from the coverage. To, you've got nowhere; it's got nowhere near the code. And in fact, I can complete. I've seen examples where I could completely change the code. The test still pass. Like switcher, less than to a greater than, and like because it's mocked everything out. So I said about switching less than to greater than start moving into trying something more formal like some automatic mutation testing which will change the code and see if your tests still pass or not it's loads of fun try it out or do some manually just to see what happens try and job over your test suite once in a while and see if it's pulling its weight brief story uh, let's let's just zoom through this so marshall clouds talked about how we developed for his part of developing standard midpoint and it's really fascinating in terms of the evolution of starting with a few basic tests and then going, whoa, more and more edge cases. Watch his thing. I'll do a small executive summary. You'd think this was easy, right? But Bosch pointed out that the potential overflow when you add two integers together 
pro tip, sometimes that won't fit an integer. I was loitering Java's binary search for years. So sometimes these things don't get caught out for ages. You can work around that in some ways, but then other things go wrong. I gradually add on more tests. If, if you've got a type language and you're trying to find the midpoint of two integers, what happens if you send in 0 to 1? Well, at that point, you need a discussion and the tests will document what they're doing. Yeah, and yeah, flipping to unsigned and, oh, listen, you should, you should have seen what happened next. I mean, does it matter which way around the parameters go? And that happens beyond midpoint. There's a lot of mathematical things that mathematically you'd expect one thing to happen, but because computers, it doesn't. So if you've got tests with numbers in, try, if they should be swap up more roundable, give it a go, see what happens. Uh, uh, good work, Marshall. You got it same sensible in the end. Yeah, we talked about switching the order. And the, but the point there was you didn't have to be a TDD purist. You started somewhere and then gradually went, oh, and then it won't work under these circumstances. And that flushed out the requirements and becomes a discussion yeah. and documents what it does. So, yeah, OK, having just talked about numbers, back to this machine learning thing. How do you test machine learning stuff? First, we establish we, talk, we disambiguate between evaluating a model and testing the code. There's a tendency at the moment for people to have forgotten everything they should have learned about structuring code well. I should talk another day about regression to mediocrity. Well, that's another <coughs> story. I often see people making Databricks or Jupyter notebooks or similar where it ends up just being a script where they call all the library functions and go, bosh, 97% accuracy at the end. That might be OK if you are, if it is genuine, just a script to shovel some numbers into Keras or TensorFlow or whatever and get the numbers back out. OK. But as soon as you start having some logic in there, like to cleanse the data or similar or decide how to graph things or write things out to a database or a CSV file. If you've just got statements that aren't even in a function, it's impossible to test that. Well, that's not true. Nothing's impossible to test. Hit it with a hammer we can. <laughs> you can save out the results and compare log files and things as you can test it. But why wouldn't you put your statements in a function. Just seriously, there are a lot of notebooks out there that haven't got functions in. Pro tip, kids, you can put your code in functions in notebooks. And in fact, you can have a separate Python file or whatever you're using, Julia, or so on, that's got a functionality in that you can then import into non-cloud environment or whatever and test the functions. So, and don't put a kabillion things in one lot of function. Break it down, small steps. And if it's got randomness inside, then as we said, we can reorganise that. Just because it's data science, Python doesn't mean it's not code. All other languages are available. <laughs> you know, another thing is often the output will be a graph at that point. But again, if you, if you break it down so that you get numbers out, you can check the numbers. And there are ways of checking graphs. I should talk to Claire about approval testing. But just write functions, have small functions. It's the thing you just mentioned. With approval tests would be a way of seeing if the graphs are right or not. But it'd be so much simpler if you just looked at the numbers first. Keep that code in your notebook minimal. Like I said, break out the functions that you need to use where you're actually doing something to a separate file and use that as a library, and then you can test the library somewhere else. And you need to start thinking about how you deploy these. Quite often you can do them like live straight on the cloud, and it claims it's got its own version control thing, but then that being your workspace as your user, and that's not how to do teamwork. Keep it in a version control system, have some CI around it, if you want your notebook and you want just 
one line is in there, fine, keep it minimal, no functions there, just call the thing graph and thing, that's all. You couldn't do approval tests around the graphs, you can, it's true, it's true. How do you test code with random numbers in? We've talked about this. The simplest thing is just sending 0 or 1 all the time. You can look at averages, and that's actually a useful thing to do if you're doing some data science stuff or some finance Monte Carlo things, and that will increase your confidence. But you might not need to do a million Monte Carlo loop steps around the loop. You might be able to get away with just 10 and find it's broken really quickly. Think about properties as well. If you if you use an interest rate of zero, it'll stay at zero no matter what's going on. And that can flush things yeah. out. Yeah, I've mentioned the 24 hour thing far too often. He really happened. He did. He sat there for 24 hours waiting for it. <clears throat> yeah, there's loads of things we've not covered at this point, but um, one obvious thing that I've used effectively on many occasions is just round tripping stuff. So if you serialize and deserialize things, you find all kinds of shenanigans really easily. Um, Nico's pointed out a variety of things that go wrong between strings and doubles and things. Yeah, well, I. I in my head, serialize, deserialize gives you another way of things. So you're not looking at the behavior or when I add it or what happens. You're just playing with changing from one type to another. And representation. Yeah. Things fall out and things that might job you over when you put things in log files and stuff. Uh, we, we said hammer time. We've mentioned some hammers on the way through here, like the property based testing, the pulling out plugs and things. The, the more generally, Fuzzers are the idea of just sending loads and loads of random numbers, possibly try and flush out some security problems, I think, yeah. to, to my mind, is how they've started. But the, you can use them in a variety of different ways. I know people have given talks at Accu, and there might be one going on this conference about this kind of thing. So try them out. Even if you don't want to go full hog on the whole framework, listen to talk, try stuff, but just try sending in some random numbers itself try negative numbers then see what happens mention property based testing thinking about the properties that you expect your system to have you could technically see them as a type of fuzzer but they're drive towards trying to instead of make your thing crash by pen testing it and injecting stuff to job things over it are trying to seek out places where your properties don't hold ascending zero i expect zero to come out the other end of this big neural network Monte Carlo monster or something and it will find things for you. So you use FizzBuzz in it as an example earlier. Mm. One of the properties of FizzBuzz is that all the numbers that are divisible by three should report Fizz. So how do you test all of the numbers that are divisible by three? Just think about what all of the numbers means. <laughs> so do you just test the ones between 0 and 100 and hope that that's good enough? But property-based testing allows you a way of capturing the is divisible or numbers divisible by three as a property. So you don't test them all, but it will generate a, a yeah. fairly large random selection. And it's a way of highlighting places that you can then capture in a real focused unit test when, yeah, when and if it finds problems. I, mean, I, I see an analogy here with genetic algorithms, which I did in my PhD, where you try some random stuff and it maybe finds a solution to a problem. So that, that's the flip side of this. This is trying to find a problem with your solution yeah. by doing random stuff, whereas genetic algorithms try and find a solution to the problem by doing random stuff. It hasn't done the brute force test everything because it can't do all the numbers. Yeah. But it might be enough to find some stuff. I, uh, mutation testing I mentioned on the way through where you change the code and see if the test still passed. Cosmic Rays, awesome one for Python. Other languages are available and mutation testing frameworks. Just manually change the code and see if any tests break. That's a good way of learning a new code base. Yeah, machine learning. Mind you, that, let's flip side this. Instead of like talking about data scientists saying they tested their code and got an accuracy of 99%. <coughs> 
and similar things. You can make the machine test code for you. We just talked about fuzzers and property based testing. I see Sharp have got a couple of tools called PEX and Moles that automatically generate tests for you. Loads of them look at getters and setters, and loads of them moan about um, null argument exceptions, but that's a style thing, so you can ignore that. But they will find stuff you hadn't thought of. Most of them are a bit rubbishy. I, like I said, they're, they're whining on about getters and setters and things. I'm not as interested in that. Controversial, don't have getters and setters. Bosh. But there's play with these things, and you will eat up. Anything that flips your head around with different ways of looking at things again. Oh, that's interesting. That's quicker. It's awesome. I mentioned acceptance testing or approval testing. And he's broadened this out to acceptance testing. If nothing else, we can, we can do some behavior driven development and talk to other pe non techie people about the tests. Play around with the Gilded Rose CASA if you haven't done before. It's tremendous fun. The idea here is you record what it does now. And if you can only do that by like saving a log file, you've then at least got one stable point. You can change the code a bit and do a diff on the next log file and check that it appears to be the same. You might end up wanting to put in some more like logging statements. And with anything that drops out, log files or graphs as well, I mentioned graphs, you can it's still in a binary format, so the machines can then spot differences for you. So there's some ways around that larger system, things mm. like log files and graphs that give you a way into this if you landed with a big monster that has no tests. But your own chaos monkey, unplug cables, just loosen your head up and find ways of trying to break stuff because that will increase your confidence. Think like a tester. <laughs> Look at the coverage, that can be really useful. But again, code coverage tools look at coverage of code, obviously. You need what you really need is requirement coverage. And look at see if your tests are pulling their way. If so, there's no point in doing something a thousand times if it just for the happy path, just because that's a normal. Yeah. Production like data. I haven't got time. If it worked once and it's a repeatable experiment, I'm happy with that. If it's not repeatable, it sometimes passes and sometimes doesn't. That's another story. Fix that. Don't stand for that. Rant about it. I, th I think actually, on top of the confidence and everything, I talked about trying developers' patience earlier. This is all about time to feedback. Between you and me, if I kick off a test and it takes like two or three minutes or worse, an hour or so, I'm going to end up opening more tabs on my browser and trying to read the entire internet. Last time I checked, I'd hit 105 tabs, but that's another story. You want things to be quick. That's why unit tests, I don't care if they're integrating with stuff a bit. And actually, I want the feedback from the customers and the BAs quickly. I want them to be able to run this too. I want them to be able to see CI. Or feedback from people or machines quick and quicker than that just focus on making it quick accurate clear messages and all the rest that's about the time to feedback as well if the message says expected true got false and then i start debugging it it's obviously slow so good messages so you got this we kind of nearly done then talked about how we test things and frequently about just breaking things down you need to structure things so you can test them but then that's good if you want to like change the system a bit and use different libraries or a different database if things are small composable parts you so much more that's so much easier the tests are more than just a thing that you have to do it's they can drive discussions and communication mm -hmm. Good way of doing things. Where do you test? Ah, as many places as you possibly can. Use your imagination. Like, seriously. What do we test? Well, everything. Try, we'll just try and think about what's the worst thing that could possibly happen. And if you go, yell yeah, right. Make sure you've at least got a log message out of it so as you know that it's it's in, in the swampy bit or something. It's, it's okay. 
think about what could possibly go wrong. And you might not be able to stop things if someone does pull out all the network cables fine. If it just logs locally, then you can find out what happened afterwards. It's okay. It's okay. Basically, we're talking about making your life easier as a dev. Be selfish. Be lazy. Why do we test? So it doesn't go wrong in front of a customer. So I don't get called at three in the morning. So I can deploy code at any time. Hooray! Including during the day and be confident it's going to work. So I can go to the pub or stay at home or go to the gym. Damn you, COVID. <laughs> you can test this. Hammer time. Hammer Hit time. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Any questions? Well, have a look. Hello again. So we did manage to stay the course without being thrown off the internet well so done. far. So if there are any questions, it's probably easiest if you put them in the QA window. Um, there's a at the bottom of the Zoom window, there's a Q and A button, and then we can track them in there. Otherwise, that's it. See you at the lightning talks. So you can see a question from Roger Orr saying that flaky tests seem to be an example of a broken window syndrome. How do we persuade people to fix them? Oh, that's really hard. And yeah, we talked as during the course talk said about you run it once, you go, oh, if you run it again, it'll be fine. And people stick with that. I frankly will try and get away with marking those as ignored so as they don't run each time and try and think about what it was trying to test and see if I can come out with smaller tests that help me narrow down what's happening. Loads of times you get banned from dealing with technical debt and stuff. Try, yeah. my, definitely start of 10, flag them up as ignored and see what happens. That's like boarding the window up or something. That might at least get a conversation going. But yeah, that's difficult. You need time to investigate that kind of thing and trying to press for time and explain why tech debt matters is, well, try and talk about confidence, try that. But for starters, just mark them as ignored or delete them. If they're, it's telling you something, but it's not helpful at that level, I think. Yeah, and so it needs the buy-in, doesn't it, from the team to make sure that, everybody understands that flaky tests are a problem in sort of a systemic problem um, and that you need to keep an eye on it. And I found that when people understand the idea of continuous integration and what are the unit tests trying to tell you, that that can help that keep the flaky tests to a minimum or eradicate them. Um, but yes, Jez has just put in the chat about trying to work out where the flakiness comes from. And yeah, mm. that's a very good point. Yeah, that's what I was saying about breaking it down. If you can narrow it down to this bit's talking to the database and somebody's changed the data during the course of the test, or just like binary search, chop, narrow it down. But stir things up by marking it, ignore, why not? So someone's calling me out for moaning about not wanting to debug tests and said, I find it's much better to debug tests than not know about the failures. And sometimes the tests provide an easy setup for reproducing the problem. Can I comment on that aspect? You're absolutely right. So if I've got a testing framework and I can capture something out of some production logs, that I can then hook it straight in there and I've immediately got something I can debug. I'd phrase that as I'm investigating a problem using the setup and testing framework and that's beautiful and that's brilliant and really helpful what i don't like doing and what i meant and perhaps i didn't make myself clear is i've caught myself several times where the assertion messages are really unclear going well what was x at the time and stepping through in the debugger to find out what x is or some other variable whereas if i change the message to tell me what the variable is if nothing else is much quicker the tests still run in those microseconds or nanoseconds. And that has got to be quicker than me hitting F5 or F10 loads. 
So then I'm just saying about if it got an existing test suite and something goes wrong, maybe you need to debug it first to find out what's happening, but try and nudge yourself to a point where you get clear messages out. If you're in the debugger, you might be wanting to know what variable values have, what values variables have on the way through. Don't debug that. Make the unit test or the tests tell you those values and then it will be much quicker. But yeah, you can use a testing framework to do lots of investigation work and problem fixing. That's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so Andy Bagram asks, do you prefer to pass in a fixed clock or presumably, I guess, Andy, you mean some kind of stunt, something that could be... Time provider. Time, time provider or passing in the actual time. And, well, I mean, my answer to that would be it, that really depends. Um, Consultant. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know, broaden the question out to, you know, the random numbers or database connections or whatever. And it's it depends. I, I guess it, it it's going to be so specific to the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, if you're going to be, if the, you know, the time that you need is... <laughs> Just something you need right now. Is it easier to just pass in the value than to pass in a, some kind of provider for it? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that might be the starting point to begin with. The quickest thing to do is just go, right, well, let's pretend it's midday or mm. whatever date time. You're then running the risk of somebody writing some calling code that calls out to the single so that is date time now. So if you were to architecture it in terms of having some kind of time provider, you might stop and shifting the problem to somewhere else and making some other code impossible to test. So, yeah, it depends on the context. True story of my own. In an interview, I, I, it was really clear that I was being expected to write exactly this and to, to create a time provider to wrap this up. And I made the test pass by passing in a value. And my it was it was kind of a pair programming interview. <laughs> and, uh, and my interviewer said yeah that's made the test pass but it's not really what i meant and oh. it was perfectly obvious to me what he wanted but i thought i'd stir it up a bit just by passing in a value and that was all that was needed under that situation so yeah shrug it depends <laughs> any more for any more? Yeah, it's traditional to always say it depends as an answer to a question. Sometimes that that's, lets you have a little bit of thinking time, so it might be cheating, but it's traditional. Right? <laughs> it's also traditional to go to the bar and get a pint before the lightning talks, isn't it? It's um, true. Can't see any more questions. Well, we're going to be hanging around in the lobby somewhere, I expect, for the There's course of the evening. There's a discussion room on Discord as well. For, are we in Track D? We're in Track D on Discord, and we'll be keeping an eye on that too. So, see you in the virtual world. See, yeah. see you Hopefully in the see you in real there. life at some point. Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for joining us for this, and take care out there.